Well, good morning everybody. Thank you so much for calling in today. What we're doing, the webinar is called A Man Is Not A Financial Plan. Now, the webinar has been recorded and it's going to be recorded in three different parts because it's actually sometimes quite difficult to find an hour to listen back to it. And what we're going to do is split it into about three different parts. So each part's about 20 minutes, which is going to make it a little bit easier then when you want to go back and listen. Now, there's um, on the site, you're going to see that there's a little box where you can type your comments. So that when I'm talking, if you've got some comments, queries, anything you'd like to say, if you can type it in there, I'm going to be able to respond to you. Now, a lot of people start a webinar by telling them, telling the audience all about themselves. I'm actually going to be a little bit different. I'm going to start by telling you a story. And it is a true story about a client of mine. She came to see me a little while ago, she was age 60, and said her plan was to retire at 63 and she wanted a pension review because she wanted to see how much money she was going to get. So from my point of view, there was a three year planning period that we had there. She was a professional earning roughly about £125,000 a year. So what I did, I asked her what income she was looking for when she retired. And what she wanted was about four grand a month, so about 48 grand a year gross. So that, that might sound quite a lot by some people's standards, but the way that I do my advice is to start off by asking someone what it is they're looking for, and then we see if we can achieve that. And then if we can't achieve that, then we look at some other options. During the meeting, she gave me a number of papers about her existing pensions, and I could tell by looking at them that she was not going to achieve four grand a month. But obviously I couldn't say anything until I'd gone away and done proper research. So I did the research. In fact, the pensions were providing four grand, but in fact, they were providing four grand a year rather than four grand a month. So I had sleepless nights leading up to our meeting because I thought, how on earth do I tell this lady that she's planning to retire in three years time and her income is pretty poor. Luckily, when I told her, she actually burst out laughing and it was a nervous response, but of course it made it a lot easier for me to then sit and have the conversation with her. But I did have to tell her she wouldn't be retiring at 63 Potentially, she would be retiring at 65 and needed to consider that she was going to be working until she was 70. But, you know, what it meant was at least we had a starting point and we could plan. And what I'm doing is working with her now, trying to get a plan together. She has got a sizable house that she's going to downsize. So it's not all doom and gloom. But of course, had we met up earlier, we would have been able to get a plan in place that she could retire at 63. So the reason I've told this story is, you know, I never want to be in that position again of having to tell a client that she's not going to be able to retire at the age that she wants with the amount of money that she wants. You know, if you start planning at an early enough stage, you know, you can often achieve what you want to achieve. Now, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to end up with more money if you start planning earlier. But if you've planned earlier, at least you're not going to get caught up in terrible shock that you leave it right to the last minute before you do anything, you know, and then there's this terrible bombshell that hits you. Right. Oh, just had a comment come in from Sue. Yeah, saying what a horror story it is and hope she doesn't get into that position. So yes, it is. It is a horror story. And, and the moral of the story is get a plan. Start looking at it as quickly as you can. It doesn't mean you'll have extra money, but it should mean that you don't end up with a terrible shock. And of course, the thing is with my client, because of the amount of money she was earning, she did have enough money to put it away in a pension. It's just she didn't really think about it. So having hit you with that horror story <laughs> let's move on right um we've got a slide here which for some reason has a man sticking his head in the sand with a and he's got a briefcase on his bottom not quite sure why he's got a briefcase on his bottom but but the point of the slide is 
don't stick your head in the sand. It is very easy to put off planning for retirement because it seems such a long way off. But you know, at some point, you do have to address it. And it's really surprising how many very intelligent women that I meet who just as soon as you start talking about finance, the shutters come down and they go, oh no, no, can't do maths. But actually, provided something is explained to you, there's no reason why you can't understand it at all. So certainly the whole of this talk is not going to be overly technical. And I will try and make it as lighthearted as possible. Now, we do have to bear in mind though, I'm talking about pensions. They're not going to be laugh a minute. So there's no point in me telling you at the beginning, you know, it's going to be a bundle of laughs because it's not. But it's, it's going to be lighthearted. And I want to be able to get, get over to you as much information as I can, not in a technical manner. It's just nice and down to earth, no jargon, just so that you can understand it. You know, really what you want to know about any financial plan you've got about your pension or your investment is how much do I pay in and how much do I get out? And I am on a real mission to try to get females to take responsibility for their finances and their financial well-being. And I would really love that at least one female from today's talk gets back to me, you know, tomorrow, next week, next month, whenever it is, to say that as a result of the talk, they really did go away and start to do something different. So, if we just move on and we look at, you know, what we're going to discuss today, we're going to start off with looking at your current financial position and how you work that out. Because, of course, unless you know where your starting point is, you've got no way of knowing whether you've improved. So we're going to do that first so that you've got a means of measuring. We're then going to look at debt, you know, and what happens if you've got a certain amount of debt, if you've got borrowing and you don't know how to get it under control. That's going to be addressed. And then lastly, we're going to move on to looking at savings, particularly looking at pensions and ISA. So even if it's only a small amount, you do want to be saving on a regular basis. So I do hope that sounds, sounds what everyone's looking for. There is a, some detail now about me. And the reason why I want to tell you about me is that if I'm going to sit here and talk to you all and give you advice as to how to look after your finances, well, actually, then you want to know what are my, what's my experience and my criteria for being able to tell you about that. So just to give you a little bit of my background, I'm a chartered financial planner with the award-winning firm Informed Choice Limited. For anyone who's not sure what a chartered financial planner is, and it's not a term that's necessarily understood by everybody, it's effectively, it's an IFA, an independent financial advisor, but with more exam qualifications. So within my industry, an IFA is level four qualified, and a chartered financial planner is level six. So it is a fair leap up. And chartered is the highest qualification within my industry. And both myself and the firm have chartered status. And that's because if myself and the firm are going to advise on how you look after finances, well, actually, we need to have as many technical qualifications as we can. I, in fact, also hold fellowship status within the CII, who's my examining body. And there's only about two, I think the last figure I saw, 219 females in the whole of the UK who have that status. Now, because I'm um, advising females, obviously it makes sense that I'm female myself. And um, no nonsense advice. Oh, in fact, what I forgot to tell you, I'm a chartered accountant. So what it does mean that I have many years of dealing with finances. I understand maths, I understand money, and where I think my skill is in teaching people what some a lot of this means, but without being overly technical, just you know, down to earth. Typical advisor, financial advisor, is male, middle-aged, grey hair, grey suit. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. 
But if that's not the sort of person that you feel you're going to relate well to, well, then maybe that's why there's a lot of women out there not taking financial advice. And also I'd say because I give, you know, I'm very down to earth, no nonsense, no jargon, that really helps because there are a number of financial advisors who actually talk an awful lot of jargon, give people so many options that actually the client is frightened of making the wrong decision. So they end up not doing anything. Now, my view is it's much better to go get on, do something, take some action. You know, with hindsight, often if you look back, you might have done something slightly different, but much better to have taken action in the first place and just get on with it. Now, one of the reasons why I particularly target females and why we have, you know, a man is not a financial plan is because I really do believe that all women, whether married, single or divorced, need to take financial responsibility. Because for all of us, we're the ones who are going to benefit the most by looking after our finances. So if we're not going to take responsibility, well really it's highly unlikely that anybody else is ever going to be as motivated as us to do something about it. There's some horrible scare statistics here. You know, from the Scottish Widows pen, uh, Women and Pensions Report, we've got a statistic that only 30% of women are optimistic about their financial future, and statistic that two thirds of women over the age of 50 have inadequate pensions. A statistic which comes from Office for National Statistics shows that at the age of 56, the average male pension pot is six times the size of the average female pot. So what this is showing is that there are just so many women out there not doing anything about their finances. You know, what I've said is we all need to take responsibility. And of course, before you can take responsibility, you under, need to understand a few things. So we're actually going to get down to the nitty gritty now. And remember, I said the first thing we're going to do is calculate your starting point. So what we're going to do is calculate what's called your net worth and we're going to, uh, as of today. So if you get a piece of paper, draw a line right down the middle of it and then on the left hand side, label up your column heading is assets and your assets are everything that you own. So the sort of thing that you're going to write down in this column will be your house if you own it. And even if you've got a mortgage on it, put down your house and the value that it's worth, excluding the mortgage. Also add any investment properties. So if you've got a buy to let, you've got a holiday cottage, put down your car. And then, you know, all along the old, all the savings, you know, the premium bonds, your bank account savings, all of those. Put down investments. So that's ISAs, you know, investment trusts, stocks and shares that you hold, any endowment that you hold, and pensions. So against each of those lines that you've written down, put the value next to it. Now what you'd need to do for your pensions, ISAs, endowments, that sort of thing, you need to speak to your pension provider or investment provider and get an up-to-date statement. So that is then your list of everything that you own. Now, if you've got anything else by way of value, you know, do add it to the list. Personally, I wouldn't bother with furniture unless you've got antique furniture, because really to be putting down how many tables and chairs you've got is going to take an awful lot of time and probably not worth very much. If you've got expensive jewelry, of course, add that. If your jewellery is, you know, cheap and tatty, probably not worth putting that down. But put down all your assets, put the value next to them, add them up, and then you've got the value of your total assets. On the other side of the paper, head that column up liabilities, and your liabilities represent what you owe. So the sort of thing that's going to go in that column, um, mortgage, and that's either a mortgage on your main home or on an investment property, put down any 
credit card balances that you have. So balances that you're not paying off come the end of the month. They just keep rolling over. Put down your loan balances. You know, so the full amount that you'd have to pay to pay that loan off. Also, any higher purchase that you've got. You know, if you've got a student loan, dependent on your age, and you know, any overdraft you've got or any amount that you've borrowed from family, friends, that sort of thing. You now, overdue bills, put those down. So again, make a full list of everything that everywhere that you own money. Add that up and that represents your total liabilities. So to calculate your net worth, your net worth is your total assets less your total liabilities. This is what we're going to do that gives you your starting point. And what you want to do now is set some form of target as to what do you want your net worth to be in, for example, 12 months time. And then you need to have a plan as to how to get it. And, you know, review it on a regular basis and ask yourself, you know, what on earth can you do to improve your net worth? Question that I have been asked before is what happens if your net worth is negative? Now, if it's negative, that is not a great starting point. What that means is your liabilities are greater than your assets. So in other words, you owe more than your, you own. But it's your starting point. And if that's the case, you know, you know where you're, where you've started. And you therefore know that with as much urgency as possible, you have to get yourself into a positive position so that your assets exceed your liabilities. So as before, you know, that's your starting point. Monitor it regularly and have a plan as to how to improve it. So, of course, what I've done is I've sat here saying you need to improve it. The obvious question that's going to come back is, well, how? Now, remember we said net worth is total assets, less total liabilities. So two ways to improve it. You either increase your total assets or you reduce your total liabilities. Or in an ideal world, you do both of them and you're going to get there quicker. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to come on to look at both of those options and how you can actually implement it. But before I go any further, I do just want to see if there's any questions that have arisen. So if you've got any question, just type it in. Right. OK, questions come in from Lorraine. As a rough rule of thumb, what should your net worth be and what should you grow it by? OK, there isn't really a rule of thumb because your net worth and the figure that you want it to be is going to be very different for each individual. It's going to depend totally on your circumstances, on how much you earn, because someone with a low salary, what, what they're going to feel comfortable with as a net worth is probably very different to someone who's on a much higher salary. What you want to do is look at the figure and consider what would you feel comfortable with. So it is going to be very different for each individual. You want to set yourself the plan as to, you know, in 12 months time, it is now X. I want it to have grown to Y and, and make sure it's a figure that is achievable. It's achievable with hard work, but it is achievable because, again, if you've got net worth of £10,000 now, no good setting yourself a target that you want half a million pound in a year's time. Because what you're going to realise pretty quickly is you can't get there and you'll probably give up. Whatever you've got now, set a realistic target for a year's time. So it does give you something to aim at, but something that with hard work is achievable. Right, got a question coming from Claire. How do you know the value of your endowment and pensions, etc.? Well, what you want to do, you want to speak to the provider. Speak to the provider and get an up-to-date statement. If you go back through all your paperwork, you should have details of who your provider is, your reference number, that sort of thing. So phone them up and just ask, ask them to send you a statement. Now, hopefully you're going to understand 
the statement, you're going to be able to see the box on it that explains to you what the value is. Obviously, if you have any query, I'd say get back on the phone to them and just say, you know, I've got an awful lot of figures on this statement, which is the one that tells me what it's worth today. Now, no other questions have come through at this stage. If, if there's anyone on the call who's got a question which they don't particularly want to raise in open forum, you know, that's fine. Get, get back to me privately, you know, on the phone or email afterwards and we'll do it. Now, what I did say is that we're going to do the recording in three different stages. This is where we're going to end part one as the recording, but obviously stay on the line because actually we're just ending the recording and then we're going to start up again, but recording it as a separate part. So just hold on for one minute and then we're going to start again very quickly afterwards.